So thank you all for staying. Uh, it's been an hour. We've got a chance to check out the zoo, and I'm really glad that people came back to watch uh, the presentation. This is the first time that I'm presenting in English, so it's a bit new territory for me, so uh, I'm going to try my best. Um, today's topic is uh, cross-culture, taking your shop abroad, and some of the challenges that you might face when uh, you have a successful product in one territory and you want to take it to the next. And the thing that got me um, interested in this, in this uh, particular topic, this particular problem, was this quote by Jason Cohen, uh, founder of WP Engine, uh, which is a global hosting company. And he said, you can't just walk into Germany and start selling stuff. And I was like, where does this complexity come from? Because he's uh, bootstrapped, I think, four or five companies. Uh, he recently did a... Uh, podcast with Remkes. Um, he's, uh, he's got a lot of experience in scaling companies and, and uh, doing this uh, worldwide. And why is he still struggling with these kinds of challenges? And let's get the obvious out of the way first and start with language. Uh, and the best way for me to figure out where these challenges are is to look at the very big players, like the, the uh, companies that, that, that have got this down. Um, so when you look at the IKEA website for two different countries, in this case it's uh, Estonia and uh, uh, Latvia. They, sorry? Lithuania. Lithuania, <laughs> that's it. So the, the style of the website and the, the images that they're using is almost identical, um, but the text they're using is a different language. And we know that language is infinitely difficult. For example, when you start with an English text in your home country and you start translating it, you figure out that most translations don't have the same text length. So this is a very obvious uh, example of a pretty common mistake that's not just made by small companies or startups or uh, companies making their first moves into new territories, but also by like the biggest companies in the world, they still struggle with this. Um, a different thing, and it's a kind of uh, related to the localization part, is uh, and, and it's particular to web shops, is pricing. When you start with your base currency and you go abroad, you might figure out that there's a different currency symbol but there's also uh, a different way of describing decimals, or so thousands parts. But there's also a country where the, the currency symbol isn't just one character, but it's multiple characters or in the entire world. So you have to figure out how this changes in the territory that you're going to. Also with names, when you're shipping uh, to people or want to get to know them or want to send uh, them your newsletter, you've got this great variety in, in names that you wouldn't expect to be possible. Um, I think the, the second one is a Swedish person who's just got a semicolon in his name for some reason. Um, all of these are, are valid. Uh, a single letter as your first name, yeah, why not? Right? Uh, when we're shipping things internationally, you might think of a single place as a place with a single name. And in the Netherlands, uh, to, to start, uh, we have Den Haag with the Dutch name Schavenhagen, like a, a second name for the, for the same city. And internationally, it changed so much. So you can't just expect uh, one translation to work in every situation. You have to deal with addresses when shipping stuff abroad. This is a valid UK address. It's uh, four characters and four uh, numbers. But this message that this arrives somewhere and people can enter this into your website and expect stuff to show up at the door. So there's many more examples of this. Um, I'm sharing uh, this link if you want to do uh, this. Sure. At the end there's also a link uh, uh, once more with examples of uh, translations errors, uh, common or uncommon names, uh, Unicode translations all kinds of stuff and exceptions that you need to take care of when moving into a new territory. But 
let's take language out of the equation. Let's, uh, language is a difficult part, but it's not the only part that makes it difficult. For example, the media assets that you're using might change based on how they're interpreted in a different location. So these are uh, the corporate sites for Coca-Cola France and Coca-Cola Canada. They're both French, no problem there. But on the left, we're seeing an urban cityscape with obviously French people sitting in front of the Arc de Triomphe or something similar. And on the right, we see a much different scene of a valley green. Like they, they want to uh, communicate a different experience to the people visiting the site. The same for uh, when you look at the Nespresso sites for uh, uh, Nespresso Instagram for Brazil and Netherlands, the audience that you might be targeting in two different geographies might be different. In the Netherlands, it's a lot about the finished product and the experience that people are having while consuming it. And they also have um, like a, a, a partnership with a local festival. All of these aren't relevant to the Brazil market, and uh, in the Brazil market, they're much more focused on how is, are things being produced, uh, like the, the, the feeling of uh, maybe the type of employer that they are. And also, let's take language back into the equation. There's a lot of images on the internet that contain text. So you can just use a single uh, media library and put it on a multi-site and expect five, six, seven different language uh, sites to all use the same images uh, on, on different language sites. And also consider how color is interpreted in different cultures. Uh, for example, I think it's uh, down here, 53. Uh, it's love. Like in the Western culture, uh, red is a, is a common color used for love or communicating love. While well, in different cultures it might be green or yellow or blue. And uh, also in different markets you might have competitors that are already using your color scheme and when you enter this new market you might be confused with this new competitor. So think about the way you're using color in this new market. So we've taken language out of the equation but the problems that I'm um, showing like this is the other side of the world, right? So instead of a six hour flight, let's take a 30 minute train ride and go to Belgium because we have uh, our southern neighbors who also speak Dutch. So we can compare <laughs> the uh, cool blue Dutch website and the cool blue Flemish website. And they're both Dutch. They're both selling exactly the same pro uh, products to mostly the same uh, culture people. But if we check out uh, this Dutch uh, uh, product detail page for a refrigerator, you might see some things that are typically Dutch. And when we switch to the Belgian side, there's a lot of subtle differences. Uh, you might not have noticed. Let's see it again. All right. So let's zoom in on a couple of them and think about the implications of what they're doing here. So first. In the Dutch market, there's a thing called Consumentenbond. And in the Netherlands, this is like a recognized brand. People see this and trust, like they have done the reviews, they trust this and they're like a sign of approval. In Belgium, they're not using on exactly the same product this type of, of mark. Maybe in Belgium, there's a different product that's got a better review by a local reviewer there. Also, in the Netherlands, they're uh, delivering to the doorstep, uh, but they're charging for delivery inside and connecting the device. In Belgium, probably because they're still uh, uh, gaining territory there, the service is free. So there's a, a, a difference in how they're, they're uh, offering the same product. In the Netherlands, there's 14 stores, and in Belgium, there's seven. So it might be that in Belgium, people have to drive further to see the actual product. Also, in the Netherlands, it's uh, Beste Webwinkel, and in Belgium, it's Klantvriendelijkste 
web shop. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, uh, small wordings like this, and we'll see that on the next slide as well, um, that, that really make a difference in how it's interpreted and feels like something that your neighbor might say instead of someone from uh, a different country. So this one is also very interesting, and there's a couple of things going on here. Um, first of all, uh, here again, they're mentioning we're putting it uh, uh, on the doorstep. While on the right, they're saying we're putting it on the place that you're going to use it. And they're also saying we're going to take away the old device, but only if you put it at your doorstep or if uh, in Belgium, uh, we're going to take it away from where you were using it or where we're replacing it. In Belgium, they're using the word geleverd, and in the Netherlands, it's bezorgd. It's very subtle differences, but these are the kind of things that they tested and uh, uh, they, they've noticed that they, they connect better with their target audience. Now also, in Belgium, there's suddenly a different way to pay. <laughs> this is something that doesn't exist in the Netherlands, eco-checks. Uh, and obviously, people in, in Belgium, it's a subsidy for government employees, I think. Uh, they want to use this uh, type of payment because otherwise they're going to the competitor. Uh, if you look into the footer of these websites, you're also seeing uh, uh, subtle and less subtle differences. Different payment methods are being highlighted. Of course, you might be able to pay with Ideal on the, on the Belgian web website, but they don't want you to <laughs> because it's a restriction while, while uh, going through the checkout. Uh, in Belgium, they're using PayPal. This is a, a bit of a culture thing between uh, the Netherlands and the rest of the EU, where in the Netherlands we're used to paying up front, when the rest of the EU they're used to um, paying but getting the guarantee that the vendor only gets the money when they receive the product. So with uh, a MasterCard or a credit card or PayPal, you can always uh, 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 go to PayPal and say, I didn't receive it, and they're going to refund you right away. No discussion possible. With Ideal, once you've, the money has left your account, it's gone. It's, it's uh, from the vendor. Uh, here again, we see local uh, 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 trademarks. So in the Netherlands, it's Thuiswinkel. Uh, in Belgium, it's uh, a safe shops. Dutch uh, delivery uh, partner, Belgium delivery partner, and a Dutch publisher and a Belgian publisher that, that, like, uh, that tells us how, how great they are. So what we've seen so far are companies that are doing this well. But what happens if you're not doing it well, if you're doing it for the wrong reasons? You're going to get something like this. Um, the title of the left page is uh, Brut Bioorganic, and it's been translated probably by, by AI with Brut uh, bio bio. This doesn't mean anything. And if I'm a German person trying to order at this website, this is an immediate red flag for me. Uh, at the same time, there's some input field that doesn't actually do anything on the German website. There's Dutch text on the bottom of the page. There's a lot of things that take me out of the experience of this is something that I, I want to buy from and makes me doubt my decision to buy because I'm seeing things that I, I don't understand. Why, why isn't this just part of the page? And it can get even worse if you expand too fast into territories that you don't understand. You might be wasting a lot of money and have to backtrack. Uh, Fearplay has uh, exited uh, a couple of months ago from, uh, I think, UK, Spain, Italy, a lot of territories that they were expanding into. And it's all, all uh, thrown away uh, cash. So let's think about how we're going to decide if going into a different territory is the right decision. Because there are alternatives. You don't have to go abroad to expand your audience or expand your business. So um, product development, like selling to the same audience but with a different product is, is a viable option. Uh, in the Netherlands, there's, uh, or in Rotterdam, <laughs> there's this uh, uh, designer who started with the bag on the third spot and 
uh, she, she made this out of durable material, it was a success, and instead of going like, I can sell this in Spain, she went, no, I can sell larger bags, smaller bags. And now, suddenly, she's making raincoats. These are all new products, and they're selling to the same audience as someone who buys a bag might buy something else. So, you don't have to go abroad to grow. But if you do want to go abroad, do it for the right reasons. So, reason number one is you have a unique technology in the new market. There's no one else doing this kind of thing, no one else producing it the same way, and you're just going to like, immediately win the market. Uh, second option is economies of scale. You've run into like, a, a barrier in your current market, and the only way to, to like, manage gain costs down is to produce more of the same. Then you might want to go abroad. Or sameness with existing markets. But as, as we've seen with uh, the Dutch and uh, the Flemish market, even sameness with existing market is very hard to actually get right. So how do we decide where and how to expand next? And which kind of factors do we need to take care of? So if we think about a web shop, we have a lot of activities that web shops might do. Um, every web shop is a, a unique, so the activities that the web shop you're managing, or the, that you're building, might be a bit different than this, but generally these are areas of interest or activities that you might do. So uh, think about shipping uh, delivery fulfillment, think about marketing branding and the kind of chan channels you are using, think about uh, Maybe in the Netherlands, uh, Instagram is big, but in a different territory, they're using Twitter or X. Um, think about store management, think about uh, customer service and returns. If someone is on the other side of the world and they don't like the product, what are they going to do with it? Are they going to send it back on a boat, or are they just going to throw it in the bin and you're going to refund it? Uh, payments, as we've seen in the Cool Blue example, there's a lot of subtle and less subtle differences in how people pay and how they expect to pay and how they expect their money to uh, uh, be handled and also in the regulations that you're uh, uh, committed to when going to, into a different ter territory. Uh, and we're going to match this into uh, different influences, different influences on these uh, activities that the web shop is doing. Uh, so these might be external, and we're using a framework called PESEL for this. So there might be political uh, uh, influences on the way that you're going to expand into this market. Or there might be legal uh, uh, issues that you need to take care of. Uh, when I was walking through the zoo this afternoon, someone was saying like we wanted to advertise in Germany, but they have very different rules about which kind of products you can advertise. Because if it's even re remotely uh, adjacent to something health-related, you're not allowed to advertise something like this. Um, technological issues or social issues. And at the same time, we have to take care of our internal uh, influences. Is the staff ready to handle this new market? Uh, do we have the skills to take care of the, the new tax rules that we have to uh, inherit? Can our systems or our organization, uh, organization deal with this? So if you put these two together, you end up with a matrix like this. And at first it seems a bit complicated, but we're going to do a, a very concrete example. And then we're going to do a bit wider example, and we're going to expand it on this. So let's, ex uh, uh, for example, take the uh, shipping and delivery activity and consider that we're uh, a Dutch company wanting to expand into uh, the, the Dutch Caribbean territory. So our strategy might be that we want to ship in 24 hours, because we've seen that in the Dutch market this is working, and in the new market in Curaçao, other competitors are doing this as well. So the strategy is 24-hour shipping. How are we going to get our products in Curaçao Within, uh, to the customer within 24 hours, we need a warehouse there. Because we can put it on the boat and expect it to be there. We can put it on the plane because it's going to be expensive. So we need a new warehouse. The systems 
we suddenly have two warehouses, we have two inventories, but we have one website keeping stock. So we need to know which products are where and which is getting sold out when we need to put another shipment in to the other side of the world. If we need staff for the new warehouse, we need local recruitment. So we need a recruitment agency that's going to take care of getting people to work at our warehouse. Maybe uh, we make an, an economic analysis and we figure out that there's high youth employment and we might be uh, a very, very uh, welcome employer in this new area. Uh, but at the same time, if there's people working for your company and you've worked hard in your own territory in creating a certain company culture, how are you going to maintain that company culture when half of it is in, in a different time zone on the other side of the world? So maybe you want to bring everyone together once a year. And finally, politics. Uh, it might be hard to get permits to even get started there. And then you might think, let's not go there. <laughs> let's just go to Belgium. And you can still do 24-hour shipping, but you don't need all the rest. So this is something to consider. But business is creative problem solving. So you might say, we're going to Curaçao and we're going to do 24-hour delivery, but we're going to uh, have third-party fulfillment. So we're not going to deal with new employees on the other side of the world. We're just going to hire a service to do this for us. Uh, and we need to implement the product inventory system because we're still going to have two inventories next to each other. But the impact of going into this new territory is now suddenly limited to only the factors that we, we actually touch. So if we extend, expand this a bit, and this is, I see, somewhat readable on the page, um, we can fill in the matrix for France and look at the way they're doing taxes. So uh, economic, they have different tax rules than the Netherlands, so we need to figure out where our product might fall into. Uh, maybe our software doesn't handle multiple tax rates well, so we might need to update this. And we can make uh, uh, fill in this matrix and figure out which parts might hurt and which parts might benefit, which parts might need to change, which parts can stay the same. And we can do the same thing for the UK. And suddenly we see in the UK we need to do a lot more stuff. And we can compare these two in how much investment will it take to uh, get into this uh, new UK territory as opposed to the Dutch uh, or the, the French territory. And it's a bit hard like to going in depth for all of these. So uh, to simplify this a bit, I've also made a sheet where you can take uh, just the external and the internal factors. How is the company internally going to deal with these kind of issues? And you can score them and you can do this very rapidly for like on gut feeling for a lot of territories and find out which are like immediate no-goes or which need a lot of attention as opposed to the, the ones that it might be easier to get into. I think that's it. I don't know how uh, it's been. Yeah. All right, thank you.